All right, welcome back, and I'm joined with uh, Patrick Stark, filmmaker, and uh, you're the man behind a documentary, One Life, No Regrets. We had you on the show a couple of years ago, yes. and uh, the U2 connection is palpable here with you, and you have to <laughs> let our viewers know a little bit about the uh, backstory here. This all started, uh, well, way back with a fear of singing in public. Yes, yeah, so it goes of back yourself, to, right? exactly, so it goes back to, that goes back to childhood. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we can all relate to, I mean, let alone getting up there and talking and making a speech, but singing, I mean, that's a whole other ball game, right? Yes, yeah. For and for me, I didn't even know what my own voice sounded like when I was a child because I was so terrified. And I think probably had a lot to do with siblings and, and uh, you know, trying to sing in the car, or sing around the house, and just like, stop singing, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff. But it's when you're a child, you don't realize how that's going to affect you uh, moving on with your life. And so it obviously affected me to the point where I would not sing in, in elementary school. I would not sing at Christmas concerts. Mm -hmm. I would just sort of mouth the words. And, uh, and I really didn't know what my own voice sounded like until I had purchased my first car when I was 16 years old. Right. And I could only afford one cassette deck, which was U2's Under a Blood Red Sky. And, and I would just sing along to it. And then, you know, for, at first I'm, you know, you tend to imitate the singer when you're singing along with, and then I, then I discovered that Oh, I didn't sound like Bono, I was, and, I, and I, I heard for the first time, it's like hearing for the first time, I can't say it's like actually hearing yeah. for the first time, but I heard my singing voice for the first time, right. and then I just, you know, that, that became my, my thing, I could, I could sing along to whatever music I wanted to in the privacy of the car, no one would ever have to hear me. Even if cars pulled up beside me, I just sort of, you know, <laughs> I would try not to. And do you think because that was a live album that that maybe inspired you a little bit more versus, you know, your standard studio album? Because there's there's a difference with that album in terms of the, the raw, gritty vocals. There right? is energy in that, and in fact, that's one of the first things that turned me on to you two in the first place. Is that in the early '80s when MTV came on the scene, right. I was watching. Uh, th essentially music videos that were um, excerpts from from this live album this this uh, they shot a, um, a whole movie about it and I remember seeing Sunday Bloody Sunday mm -hmm. uh, and I had never seen anything like that in my life and and I wasn't one, one of those kids to jump on the bandwagon just because other kids liked certain music there was nothing that was speaking to me nothing that was resonating with me until mm -hmm. I saw that until I heard U2's music so wow. yeah and so naturally for me the first cassette that I would buy for m this first old car that I had was mm. was that tape of course yeah and then decades later you actually had the chance to meet Bono at a local restaurant yes and yes. then you basically you know sort of approached him about going on stage with U2 how did that all start well it it started by already working on on trying to face this fear over six years yeah. I had incorporated this idea that if I was going to sing in a stadium I wanted to sing at every level from the from from the smallest stage to the ultimate mm -hmm. stage which is a stadium filled with people and um, and so I proposed you two at the beginning not that I ever thought I really would sing with them because I you know even for the longest time I thought it was impossible um, but here I was um, after six years of filming yeah. and then somebody you know said hey Bono and the band just walked into this restaurant nice. Shambar get down here everyone had known that I'd been trying to pull this off for for so long You're like this is my chance this is the chance and actually it's not the way I intended it uh, to happen because I really wanted to go through proper channels right, yeah. and here I was I found myself walking to the restaurant and essentially walking right up to the band and and if I don't I don't think if Bono was so gracious as he was and so kind he's you know he shook my hand and I felt that opened the door to at least explaining why I was standing at their table mm -hmm. <laughs> and and to have them all at one table you know, sure, I could have bumped into one of the band members, you know, throughout mm -hmm. town while they were preparing for their Innocence and Experience tour, but they all happened to be in a booth together. So that was wow. the, that was the perfect moment. It was the perfect moment to pitch my vision to the band. And Bono said, "Sure, what are you doing Friday?" So. And then there was, of course, the uh, the passing of blues legend BB King. Correct. So yes. there wasn't really room that night. Uh, no. to bring you on, right? I think that, uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of stuff going. It was, the yeah. it was the beginning of their tour, and right. I had come at them sideways. You know, it was unexpected. But I love how you describe it as like, you know, that's not how you envisioned it, but that's just how life is sometimes. It'll just throw you that opportunity or that curveball. Do I, do I take, take it? Do I take it or do I not? And, and you, you, 
you, and I listened to my gut. Yeah. And my gut was saying it, it's now or never. So, <laughs> so I did it. And and you know, f thinking of this two years later, because it didn't happen then. Um, it just led me to believe that it wasn't the right time. Not just for them, it just wasn't the right time. Right. Um, that maybe there's something something down the road that that was meant to be. And, okay. And, and maybe it was not the Friday he was referring to. Maybe he's referring to this coming, or the yeah, May 12th Friday. That's right, because you two coming back to he's town. He's a visionary, so he was looking way ahead. And it's, it's <laughs> almost like the sequel treatment here where you get another yes. opportunity. So uh, where are we yes. at with this now in terms of uh, have you been in touch with them? Are you going to try to get back on stage with them? Well, since since... Uh, 2015, when it was very close, um, you know, just sort of turned focus. We turned focus on to the editing of the film, mm -hmm. and here we are looking back at literally hundreds of hours of footage. Uh, needless to say, it's very difficult to look back on a uh, look at myself and and look at the failures and the missteps and yeah. and little victories along the way. But you realize that you know it's all learning. Um, but since that time, we also have two new interviews, one with uh, Sarah Solovich, who wrote a book called Playing Scared, which mm -hmm. is about stage fright, and also Dr. Joe Vitale, uh, metaphysician, uh, who's famous for The Secret. Um, right. They are now in the movie. And so, so these wonderful things have happened. And you know, I didn't know when U2 was launching their next tour. I didn't know that they were going to launch it again from Vancouver. And it just feels like, you know, everything sort of moved back into this position of trying one last time, um, and literally one last time. There's, you know, after May 12th, I've spent nearly, well, I've spent my 40s working on this movie. And, um, and you know, like I was talking to you before, you know, when you decide to go on a journey like this, mm -hmm. you know, you take the first steps and you realize that there's, you know, 10 or 20 other opportunities that start opening up for you and then you realize wow there's so many more things I can do and, and move on so but here they are coming back and you know I'm, I'm hopeful as far as whether or not it's gonna happen this time I have no clue it's an absolute mystery but where it could have happened before in front of 18,000 people now it could happen in front of 50,000 people. Yeah. So. <laughs> there's a teaser there's, if I ever heard there's one. There's fate. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, I, I wish you all the best, but at least you Thank still you. have crafted, I, I think, a powerful and personal story. Regardless if you get on stage or not with them, uh, I think there's just a message here uh, behind uh, your documentary, and, and that is you. about conquering your fears, right? Yes, yes. And, and it really is a chance. You see, life always comes full circle. Yeah. And when I started this journey, I set up a stage outside. <clears throat> BC Play Stadium and hired session musicians and sang for the first time in front of anybody mm -hmm. but singing at you too while they were they were you know getting their uh, stage together for the tour right. and you know hoping that they'd be wandering around and they might hear it I was looking to go from 0 to 60 and just get it out of my system but talking about going full circle, now I could be inside BC Play Stadium <laughs> as opposed to outside BC Play Stadium and on the, and on the stage yeah. and and experiencing that that stage experience, that full stadium experience that uh, has been a vision from the beginning. Man, I can't wait to see the finished product and uh, good luck. And thank you so much. We look forward to seeing One Life No Regrets. Yeah, thank you very coming much. Coming soon. Yeah, All right, Patrick, it. thank you.